Hello, this is Kevin, and I'm out on another walk. And today, I'm starting off at Bembo Ponds, which is between Midhurst and Petworth on the A272. And there's a gentleman alongside of me who has very kindly agreed to come out and do this walk with me. Now, I don't know whether I should call him Henry Brown, <laughs> or, or, or uh, remind me of the gentleman's name from um, uh, your, your other famous program. Uh, are you talking about Downton Abbey? Downton Abbey. Uh, Robert Crawley, Earl of Grantham. Earl of Grantham, there oh, you yeah. go. So I've got Hugh Bonneville with me today. So hi Hugh, how are you doing? Hello, very good. Thank you for getting me out of the house. Well, that's, <laughs> it, if you had nothing better to do. Yeah. So Hugh and I, we are, Hugh and I? I've heard that sound somewhere before, but we're just going to do a loop round the the viewpoints of Caldry, and the first one we'll be coming to in a little while is the entrance to the Avenue of Limes, which was planted for the Queen's Jubilee. And what I'll be doing, I'll be having a chat with Hugh, a little bit about his career, <laughs> a bit about his, his uh, where he was born and things like that, as he's chats usually go so Hugh can you tell everybody you know people can google you I know but it's sometimes nicer to get it from the horse's mouth so to speak where was Hugh born Hugh where was Hugh born Hugh yeah, yeah. Uh, Hugh <laughs> was born in the Lindo wing of Paddington Hospital in London my uh, mum and dad had uh, met there actually at the St Mary's Hospital um, dad was training as a doctor mum was a nurse training as a nurse and um, that's where they met and so it was rather uh, appropriate that my brother and sister and myself were all born there. Um, I grew up in initially in East Sheen in uh, South West London then moved to South East London to Blackheath when my dad moved to Greenwich Hospital and um, and then when I was <coughs> about 14 mum and dad or a bit young, younger maybe anyway mum and dad uh, moved down here uh, uh -huh. as first of all as weekenders and then lived in the area for the next well, 40 50 years and okay. um, so i've uh, this is you know i sort of consider this uh, my sort of on off home since i've been a teenager and i've lived here permanently for the last 20 something years you're almost local almost local but of course <laughs> you know my wife who was born and bred here says of course i'm a townie all oh, right <laughs> <laughs> so when you well you you grew up around that area you say as she, as she you know that so where was you what education did you have i was uh, i always say i was born i wasn't born with a silver spoon but a very nice set of crockery i, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, i went to a little kindergarten in uh, east sheen a place called fledglings i can remember that and then i went to uh, a, a prep school in Dulwich in South East London and then I went to boarding school in Dorset, uh -huh. a place called Sherbourne. Oh yes, yeah. So I've spent a lot of my, uh, my, uh, well all my, my, my sort of memories are coloured with, you know, big open fields and, and uh, countryside uh, yeah. rather than t too much of the smoke and uh, city life, even though I spent a lot of my adult life in, in you know, in London. But um, no, my, my education was, I was very blessed, very fortunate and um, I did a lot of acting at school uh -huh. and uh, joined the National Youth Theatre when I was about 15, 16 and that was a real turning point for me because you know when you're at school and you're put in the school play there are some people there who sort of treat it like detention you know they right Jenkins you're in the school play for, <laughs> for misbehaving but I loved being in plays I've always loved being part of a story you know people telling stories whether I'm visiting a theatre or creating stories of my own or being in plays yeah I just always loved that sense of uh, use of the imagination and um, so joining the National Youth Theatre was a real turning point because suddenly you're with you know 50 or 100 people who all want to do the same thing yeah yeah of course yeah. and uh, that was uh, I'd, ne I'd never any intention of becoming an actor but it was a hobby I loved and um, you know that really was a crucible of of uh, those energies and talents yeah and uh, made some good friends there and that sort of looking back I can say that that set me on the path I then took yeah of course yeah so when, when what was your let's say, let's talk about your more recent career what was the first big break that you got in in, in on the stage or film or my first big break was getting my equity card all oh, right uh, <laughs> because back in 1985 
86, uh, you needed an equity card to become a professional actor. It was a closed shop. Yeah. And um, I was, uh, I'd gone to drama school. I was doing a postgraduate year at a drama school and I just wrote to all the directors and, and uh, or rather theatre producers and casting directors and uh, rep theatres that I could. And, um, you know, most of the time you don't get a reply. Well, if you did get a reply, it was a sort of photocopied thing saying you're on file, which usually means you're in the bin. Yeah. But some people, you know, keep keep, keep note mm -hmm. for future reference. But um, I was lucky enough that I got two auditions out of the 250 letters I wrote. And uh, one of them was at the Open Air Theatre Regents Park. Mm -hmm. And um, it just happened to land on the director's desk on the right day, out of season. He wasn't looking to cast at that moment particularly and um, anyway he was kind enough to get me in <clears throat> and I auditioned and got my equity card and I can remember the the moment that um, I'd gone up to Scotland to stay with a mate and I arrived there and there was a message from my mum saying would you ring Mr Conville at Regent's Park so I rang and I can just I can it was so weird how these memories snapshot in your mind mm. in your mind but I was looking out of a window at a sheep on a Scottish hillside <laughs> when he said um, I'd like to offer you your equity card and for me my world changed you yes, know, of I, I still get emotional thinking about it yeah, yeah. because that was I can trace every single thing in my life in mm. my career back to that moment well wow. and um, you know I held a spear and understudied an actor called Rafe Fiennes who was playing Lysander in a Midsummer Night's Dream and I, um, I, I wasn't even a fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream <laughs> Kevin I just bashed a symbol at the back of the stage but that was my first so that's break. Also, okay well just here just in front of us let me just turn this around so you can see where we're going we've got to do a left here just up here in a corner as the rain comes on again <laughs> so just here as we go up here you'll see to your left hand side there Hugh a plaque and it tells you all about what so this says, this avenue of lime trees was planted in 2012 to commemorate the diamond jubilee of queen elizabeth ii that's it Cowdery estate yep and uh as i was saying to you before we started i've i've walked well the length of the south downs way over there mm -hmm. i've you know walked points south and west and east i've never been on this side of the a272 for a walk well in yeah. all my years that i've lived around yeah. here so uh this is quite special and i didn't even know about this avenue yeah. of limes well hugh and i have just walked down through this avenue of lime trees we've been having a, a chat about different things certain subjects we won't go on to about on, on here how to lose friends over covid <laughs> 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 all right <laughs> you will tell you what we've been talking about <laughs> well no i'm just saying that i think uh we were just talking a bit about how recent issues you know things like let's say brexit and trump and uh uh and and now covid really have brought about polarization in, yeah, in people absolutely you know yeah. and uh i think this 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 word the silo mentality where people if you're either with me or against me and I can only hear what's in my echo chamber that is a great great shame I was thinking back to um, uh, Justice Scalia and um, Ruth Ginsburg you know on the Supreme Court in America they famously were at opposite ends of the political spectrum mm. and debated furiously in the chamber mm. uh, over points of you know law etc but had a shared passion for opera mm. and they could you know and uh, and they would go on chat shows together to talk about their great friendship or, or their great common interests. But where it mattered in the sort of, as it were, the court of law, the, you know, the, the, the ping pong of, of the legal debate, that's where the, the claws came out and they were at each other from different points of view. But they respected each other. Yeah. And you can't help feeling that too often at the moment, you know, we're not allowing the other point of view. Um, or, or rather just being surprised by people's points of view that you thought you knew, that's or right. you subscribed to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, this is quite a mighty tree in itself. This is a lime tree. Is it? This is a rubbish it trees. This is a <laughs> <laughs> and yes, this is a lime tree, and we got a couple more down here to our left hand side. But in the tops of the tree here, you've got mistletoe. Uh -huh. And you've got it in all the trees here, and right up through the valley, which we'll be looking at shortly. I don't know what it is around here, but if you look towards the top of the hill there, yeah. the trees that are bordering the golf course again masses of mistletoe but it's you know if anybody wanted to make some money <laughs> at christmas time, christmas time. <laughs> Give us a kiss. yes yeah yeah so 
I'm taking Hugh up to the Queen Elizabeth Oak and that is just in front of us now and people that know me well with my videos and that will know that I've visited this place quite often over the last two or three years but this tree is just an, uh, as I've said before it's an incredible tree how it was pollarded so many years ago but it's got this huge gap in the middle uh, but it's still a living tree and it's just fantastic so let's have a wander up here and have a look at this tree there's several trees up through this valley one, one on the brow of the hill there another one another old oak but that that one at the top there is really deteriorating quite quickly yes, I can see. Um, I'll take you up there in a minute and show you that one so these are all planted in a line weren't they these ones here yeah but this one obviously was much much older yes it? yeah. yeah it's supposedly what thousand, getting on for a thousand years old or something yeah But again, this is just, I just, trees amaze me you, with the, the amount of the loss of the centre of this tree. Oh. And, but it's, it's still, still going. Still going. <laughs> but again, there's a plaque there that tells you all about this. Okay, I'll give that a read. There's a plaque here. The Tree Council, in celebration of the Golden Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, has designated the Queen Elizabeth I Oak one of 50 great British trees in recognition of its place in the national heritage, June 2002. It's just... It's amazing how it's completely hollowed out and you yeah. can still... So look, are you any good on your on your trees? Why is that? How, how come it's hollowed out and can still keep... Uh, I suspect going? at some point with the black inside, I think this has been struck by lightning at some point. Oh yeah, okay. Um, I'll go with that, yeah. Because you can see where it's towards the top and just in the centre. It's very charred looking. Yeah. And I think this was struck by lightning. Whether it's so in the last 50 years, 60 years, I don't know. But clearly this tree was pollarded at one time. Yeah. Um, many years ago. But yeah, I th I, that's what I suspect. At some point it was struck by lightning. But its trunk is so, I mean, the girth of this trunk is massive, or has it literally split open? Um, no, there, w there would have been another section yeah. here. So, but that's a massive trunk. That's absolutely huge, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, as I say, the, the trees, they, they're just incredible. But when, it, and obviously, you know, lots of people have said it as well, the, the more you look at trees like this, these very old trees, you can almost see faces in them. Yeah. It's, it's it's such a strange thing to see. As we were approaching, it reminded me of uh, the, uh, the there's a sequence at the end of the Merry Wives of Windsor when they go dancing in Windsor Park, Windsor Great Park, and Herm the Hunter uh, is part of it. And uh, I've often seen productions where you've got it where, where Herm the Hunter has a headdress that's like a bit like this, mm. but with these great sort of antlers and so forth, often made out of sort of woodland. Um, uh, woodland branches and yeah. nuts and bobs and it reminded me of that and also when you step if you st stood over there and look here it would, it would look scarily like a sort of helmet that's right face. absolutely it would yeah 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 but obviously at some point this is just going to deteriorate because you can see just at the oh, I'm up there just at the back there there is a an opening a gap through oh, the yeah, trunk and it's yeah. and it is beginning to split open i don't recall seeing that op that opening there four or five years ago so it's, I think what's going to happen, it's going to go the same way as the one further up that we'll have a look at in a minute. And it's just a, such a shame that, you know, this beautiful old tree is, is will eventually pack up. But it's well, just the fact that it's still living. I know, it's incredible. But well, maybe it's had its time. Maybe it's time to lie yeah, down. Yeah. We all get to that point at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the legend is that Queen Elizabeth I... Yeah. Shot, shot an arrow from here. Yeah, shot a deer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She was a hell of a shot. <laughs> <laughs> but this this park used to be full of deer. It used to be a deer park yeah. at one time. At Petworth, there's still the deer park, of course. But uh, yeah, it's it's just staggering. It, there's on top of the tree that 
top of the top of the hill there. That's a huge chestnut, sweet chestnut tree. God, um, that's enormous as well. So yeah. these are really, really ancient trees. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But down towards Esbourne, yeah. um, there's an avenue called the Race, which has got uh, is lined either side by huge old sweet chestnut trees, and some of them have got to be 600 years old. So I wonder, yeah, maybe they just you know dropped a few seeds over this way when they yeah, could planted that. <laughs> <laughs> You see it, look, it's, it's almost like a bird with its wings it, outstretched it is. and yeah. the beak up there yeah. saying, my time has come. That's right. My time has come. I'm going to lie down here. Yeah. But I've, I've actually seen the deterioration in this yeah. tree over the last three, four, five years and sections of it. And when you get around the other side, it's much more open than this where it's deteriorated. Yeah. Whoops. Oh, yeah, you can really see. Yeah. Yeah. It's rather beautiful, but almost, but also rather, rather sad as you see it waning. Absolutely. But still determined to flower, you know. Yeah. Still got some life in it. It has. There's life in me yet. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> so while while we're standing here, you um you did I said to you I first let me just explain, I first saw you that the Midhurst vaccination COVID vaccination centre and Hugh had his coat on he had a mask on he had a hat on I'd heard that Hugh was doing some voluntary work but I didn't know where and I, he spoke to me one day and I just said I think you might remember this I said why do I recognize your voice <laughs> <laughs> muffled behind a mask, mask. <laughs> and Hugh said well I, you know, I've done a bit of acting and stuff like that. And I just couldn't put a name to it. But then he kindly told me who he was, and that's when you sort of get the reaction of bloody hell, but it's Hugh Bonneville. <laughs> um, but I said to you that I'd just seen you in a big blockbuster film, and you said, "Oh, really? Which one was that?" And I said, yeah, it just kind of Paddington. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you said just now that you were born in Paddington. Yes, I know. Yes, there's a sort of synchronicity there. Yes, so yeah. is that the reason why you got the role? <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Um, but that, the first one was 2014. Uh, yeah, I think we made it in 2013, so it came out in 2014. That was a lovely thing to do. And uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it, actually, because Paul King, who was the writer-director of it, uh, and I sat outside uh, the producer's office one day um, for, ready for a meeting and I didn't really know who he was at all um, and uh, then the, you know, the Mr Big Producer David Heyman called us in and uh, we started talking about the project and I said well actually the dates you're working on really I'm afraid I can't because I'm doing Downton Abbey so I won't be able to do it but it's, you know, it's a lovely film anyway they were very kind and waited until we'd finished Downton Abbey and then we kicked off at the end of 2013 and um, it was a very happy collaboration and um, the spirit of uh, Paul King or rather the spirit of Paddington is entirely in the director he is he looks a bit like Paddington <laughs> and um, and his air of wonderful inquisitiveness and innocent uh, wide-eyed enthusiasm mm. is uh, is what Paddington's all about so and I'd grown up with those books you know and and Michael was was a, Michael Bond who, who wrote the books and his wife Sue were great supporters during the film and I think the biggest tribute we could ever have was after he'd seen a, a, a an early cut or, or a finished version of the film he came out of the screening and said to one of our producers I came I saw I was conquered oh brilliant that's lovely <laughs> which was gorgeous yeah absolutely and um uh, because it you know matters it ma that you know, when you're doing when you're adapting a story like that or a character like that which is beloved of so many millions over so many years mm. and of course really inhabits in one's imagination you know let alone uh, in the books or uh, in the illustrations and so everyone's Paddington or everyone's 
any any children's character mm. is vivid to your own imagination and you tamper with it at your peril mm. and I think a lot of people were really sort of you know outraged that Paddington was going to be given the Hollywood makeover <laughs> but in fact I think as, as Michael said that the uh, the spirit of it was there and mm. I think the second film perhaps even more so well I was just better to say you know it would it was only 18 months ago really that I looked a little bit at Paddington the first one and then watched it all the way through just a few months ago but then watched the second one and I just was glued to the, t <laughs> to the TV watching it it was yeah. just brilliant I loved it and all, all the all the cast and the characters that they played seemed to to me as a, a novice about all this sort of stuff just gelled so nicely it did. it did. They did. We did. It did. I mean, and that again is in, not entirely down to Paul because it's a collaborative effort. But his imagination uh, and the way that he casts and thinks about characters and the way he he and his co-writer Simon Farnaby, who plays the slightly creepy <laughs> security guard, uh, create those characters was so vivid and 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 genuinely collaborative. We, especially on the first film, we did quite. Sally Hawkins and I did quite a lot of improvisation around the nature of the relationship and. And, uh, and how Paddington arrives to unconsciously heal things, even though he seems to be causing chaos. Yes. <laughs> rather lovely. Um, so, uh, and the other day I got this strange message that um, <clears throat> it's been knocked. It's been it's knocked Citizen Kane off the top top spot <laughs> as the you know world's best reviewed film because someone found in a dusty cupboard <laughs> a, a, a slightly sniffy review of Citizen Kane, so it didn't get 100% anymore. So Paddington <laughs> took its top spot. Brilliant. But um, I, I, I should think Orson Welles and the others can can live with that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But how did Downton Abbey come come about and? And, um, how did you get for your... me yeah. uh, I was actually doing a, a film directed written and directed by Julian Fellows about a year before Downton came along and in and we were filming at his house as a matter of fact in Dorset we were filming one particular scene near a big tree like this <laughs> and uh, in uh, the cameras were moving around so in between setups I was talking to him and uh, uh, and I said, "What you know? What have you got on the go?" Because, like any writer, he's got several plates spinning. And he said, "Well, I've got you know two or three projects, and there's one I'm writing about. A, it's sort of revisiting the territory of Gosford Park." And uh, he started talking about describing this, the world of the of the House of Downton. And I said, "Well, that sounds really interesting." He said, "Well, I think you know there might well be a part for you." And I said, "Well, I'd love to read it when the time comes." And and then about cut to about nine months later, and it was it arrived, and it was. The thing that interested me about Downton is that the email he sent me describing the script he was sending uh, had about a paragraph describing the world of the, of the house. Mm. And it was as he described it to me when we'd been on that set of, from, uh, uh, from time to time, a, a year before, and it never changed. And mm. he, it was so clear in his mind, and that first script never really changed. Um, and the characters were so vivid and uh, I read it and I like so many others you know I just wanted to know what happened next mm. um, but of course we hadn't even filmed it yet and none of the people had been cast and I remember when uh, I you know then said I'd love to do it and I said who are you I said to our, our executive producer who are you planning to get who are you look talking to to get play the mother and he said well Dame Maggie Smith and I said well that's not going to happen is it <laughs> good luck with that mate and uh, the rest is history <laughs> absolutely yeah 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 but it's it's one of those things, though. You know, everybody at the moment is talking about the is it called the line of duty or something, mm -hmm. where people are, are so gripped by the the characters and and the plots and things like that. And Downton Abbey did exactly that for me. The, the characters drew drew you in. Yeah, I know. It's 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 quite mystifying. We've been asked the question a million times. Why you know why did it work? Why did it click? Not only here or America, but in 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 every single territory that's been released yeah, around yeah. the world, it's yeah. worked. I've even had letters from China from mm. people saying, "What a fascinating study of you know Chinese society it is." You think mm. what? Hang on. <laughs> and uh, uh, but I think it's because the characters are recognisable and endearing in some way, shape, or form. Or or if you have a particular favourite, you know the way that Julian Fellows wrote it was such that uh, if you're bored of one character another one will be on in about 28 seconds yeah, so you know yeah. and there were so many of them that yeah. you that, whose, whose stories you wanted to, to follow yeah. and we're filming another movie at the moment oh uh, yeah so I had, had heard that's, is that a third one so it's the second, the second movie, second we, movie so we did yeah. six six TV series yeah. and seasons and then uh, this is our second our second film yeah. and I have to say you, you know I, I, I we, we we became obviously over the years very very familiar with mm. what we were doing and the locations and and the way that Julian writes and each other, 
uh, and we kept coming back for more which mm. is a credit to the fact that we all got on mm. but this time because of the year we've all experienced yeah, yeah. I certainly I cherish it mm. so much more than I ever did and mm. I, I think we all do we all value the experience and we you know we're sort of looking at it for the first time mm. almost because we've been through this horrible darkness you mm. know the world over and mm. we are so lucky as a, as a team of people to be able to work on something not only that we love but that people love yeah. and, and that are and um you know i think the i think well, as the producer said the other day our audience assuming they can get to a cinema <laughs> at yeah. christmas time will be wanting this sort of tonic because mm. it's you know it's it's uh, it is what it is it's a, it's a it's an yeah. engaging piece of entertainment that several generations of a family have watched together That's over right. the years yeah, yeah. and i think now that we're hopefully emerging from this horrible gloom that it will be a bit of a tonic yeah, yeah, I'm sure so that's, that's when you you expect the release date around about Christmas time apparently but then don't forget James Bond was meant to be released last year <laughs> and we're still <laughs> so waiting we see, we're, we're still, still waiting. waiting yeah 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 brilliant yeah so it's, you know it's, it's it's great and you know I look forward to that coming out I'll, I'll certainly be giving it a watch good good yeah, but of course everybody's favorite is was was Lord Grantham wasn't it really obviously yeah. obviously then, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think and, we all I think we all acknowledge that the uh the real central character of the of the of the show is the castle. Yeah, yeah, that's, absolutely. A, that's a pretty yeah, magnificent, yeah. and they've got some pretty impressive trees yeah. in their park as yeah. well. But I plan to that's somewhere I'd like to go because um, the other two guys, or people I was telling you about, Cynthia and Steve, um, that's somewhere we've talked about going to and. and having a wander around the park it's a, the, yeah the park's lovely actually they probably um, wouldn't let me film in it <laughs> possibly not I don't know if you I don't know, I don't know what their rules are if I go up to the door and say excuse me I know Hugh, <laughs> Hugh Bonneville <laughs> they'll, they'll bar you straight away I tell you but uh, they lost a lot of trees I saw a, uh, they in one of their sort of photo books there um, they lost a lot of trees in that 87 storm oh right yeah yeah right there were some wonderful um, trees right out the front of the castle as I recall um, in the, uh, which is now which is now sort of you know they're just all gone yeah. um, that was quite devastating. Do you know? Was there a lot? A lot must have gone from around here. Um, on, in that storm. on, on the golf course, on the side of the tenth green, mm. there was a, a magnificent oak tree, and I've actually got a photo, a photograph of it no. hanging in my house. And it got it got blown down in eighty seven. Mm. And my my late uncle Jack, that was his favourite tree. Mm. And when they cut the tree up. The trunk was buried, they dug a huge hole and buried it and another oak tree was planted there with a plaque saying Jack's Oak. Oh gosh, how lovely, <laughs> how wonderful. Yeah, so that was a, that's a lovely thing to have. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so Hugh and I are just going to do a little bit of a wander along and um, I was hoping to get over to the bluebells to see what oh, they were yeah, like. Oh yeah, they look beautiful. You can just see them from here. Just over the top there. Yeah. Now we can go down through the bottom here and swing up through that way and we'll have a look at those. Yeah, lovely. Well, Hugh and I have just had a wander up to the Caldry Golf Course up behind us because we've been walking up through this valley. And if I just spin this camera around, it'll show you the, the bluebells that are coming out on either side. They're rather beautiful, but we think some of them have been nipped by the frost, perhaps, and some of them aren't up yet. So it's yeah. not quite the blanket that you might anticipate this time of year. But exactly. There's yeah. hope if the weather warms up a bit. <laughs> yeah. And but, uh, these are all the um, the mistletoe you were talking yes, about. Yes, uh, more more mistletoe right up in the top of the trees, going down through here, and it's on all the trees here, and also between. I think it's just at the side of the. 16th fairway as well it's exactly the same as these but it's just amazing but I think I think someone told me once that some mistletoe grows in the trees because birds peck the, the berries uh -huh. and then they land on the trees and they the, the seeds that they get rid of when they do what they need to do that's when they take okay that's what I was told. Whether, oh, that's, that's, whether that's true or not. Mate, I'll believe anything you tell me. I don't know anything about trees or mistletoe. <laughs> uh, we must have, you, you obviously know a better mistletoe that hangs up above the doorway. Yes, you? I know that <laughs> bit, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure somebody may have got you under a bit of mistletoe <laughs> at some point in the past. I'm sure Mrs. Bonneville did. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but some of the, when you look at some of the branches, Hugh, you look at this one just on this tree here where you've got this big gnarly bit when the branches come down 
and then it shoots out. That's what another thing that fascinates me about some of these old trees. But I've got a, a friend called Julia. Um, and she is just an absolute nut about trees. She loves to give them a hug <laughs> and a stroke, but she, she really loves those but she, trees. She, but does she know about, I mean, would she know why that, why that one's gnarly like that and it's, you know, that bit's fallen off and a new bit's grown and all that? Because I haven't a clue. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> she, just wants, she just says, that's a beautiful tree, I'm going to hug it. That's right, yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. She has an emotional connection to trees Definitely. rather than, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Rather than yeah. any knowledge that's <laughs> yeah. useful. Yeah. I think she knows a few, but uh, okay. yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, you see, my, my family background, well, they were timber merchants. Oh, were they? Yeah, down at Henley Common. Uh -huh. And uh, oh, so, so for those first 21 years of your life, that's why you were there, because yeah. of the timber? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, my great-grandfather, whose name was Ralph Ralph, and that Imagine, is imaginative true. parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, started, he, well, he, he bought what was an old brick yard, yeah. um, where they made all their own bricks and everything, they had the kilns there. And Ralph Ralph then started the Furnace Chestnut Fencing Company. Oh. And okay. that's how the, that side of it came in. And then when my dad moved down from Nottinghamshire, um, after he met my mum, because dad was in the army, he settled down here with mum and dad worked out in the in the woods as well. So I know anything to do with sweet chestnuts, so I know You're all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I loved, you know, when when because I'm a painter and decorator by trade, mm -hmm. um, and when the building trade went through any slack times, I worked for the yard and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Is it still going there, No, it we, no, it packed up ooh, some years ago. Unfortunately, because of um, family debts had to be paid <laughs> off and things like that so yeah hmm. but yeah it's uh, it's all in that we had a big sawmill as well and it was the first electrified sawmill in west sussex when um great grandfather yeah. uh, put it in but that was my favorite part about working in the yard they gave me this eventually got the job of do, using what they call a through and through saw it's a huge band saw which cut if you put a, a trunk like this on there it would cut it up you know, you could cut huge posts out of it, or whatever. But this face as well. Yeah, absolutely. Faces everywhere. Yeah. Not that I'm paranoid, but there are faces <laughs> everywhere, Kevin. <laughs> Tell uh, me, did Ralph Ralph have any brothers and sisters? Yeah. What were they few. called? They were. They had boring names. <laughs> um, James was oh, one. Right, no um, you know, those sort of things. But what I I said to my mum and dad once. I did a bit of family history research. And I said, it must have been the only person with the name of Ralph Ralph in West Sussex. If you'd Google Ralph Ralph, there's loads of them. <laughs> 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 it's just, just amazing. But, uh, yeah, but great granddad's nickname was Jumbo. Okay. Don't ask me why, I haven't got a clue. Was he very small? <laughs> he was, he was... About my height, okay. quite stockish, yeah. but he used to smoke a pipe all the time. And even after he passed away, my dad could walk out in the back garden or down the back path, and he'd come home. He said, "Jumbo's about," because he swore he could smell the pipe. Oh, but uh, yeah. yeah. So that's the avenue of limes we walked down earlier. Exactly right. Yep. And this is the arboretum. This is this is all the arboretum. Yep. And as I think I mentioned earlier on, it was laid out in 2000 and opened to the public in 2009 uh, in memory of Viscount Caldry. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a nice little gathering. Oh, the, the Frisians. Yeah, there's a, there's a rally. Going yes. On. <laughs> the Frisians are having a meeting. They're having a meeting. The That's right. <laughs> And what they're saying is, it's raining. It's raining <laughs> and it's got to stop. <laughs> We're not putting up with it any longer. No. They know something we don't, don't they? Because that's why they've gathered under that big oak tree. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> what do we want? Move. <laughs> when do we want it? Yeah. Move. 
Oh uh, uh, dear. Well, yeah, I know what's going to happen. When we finish this walk, it's going to warm up and stop raining. I know, it'll be glorious. Yeah. It's May. It should be warmer. <laughs> so annoying. Yeah. Oh dear. I think some clear sky coming through behind us. Oh dear. So what you, the filming that you were doing recently, was that to do with Downton? Uh, yes, we're currently in the middle of, of filming Downton. We're yep. about a third of the way through it. Yep. And uh, so, <clears throat> but it's been interesting because of the whole COVID thing, you yep. know, all the precautions that have to be taken. So, you know, in, in, in usual filming days, you'd, the costume department would pop onto the makeup truck or pop into your trailer to do, you know, hand over bits of costume or whatever now it all has to be properly demarcated you can't you know one department can't really cross into another yeah, yeah. department when we're on set we're wearing masks until, until we, we can take them off once we've rehearsed yeah but uh or while we rehearse rather and then but all the crew are still masked up so it's it's been taken very seriously as it yeah. has to be because obviously if you lose any days filming you're talking or if you, if you shut down because of covid then you're talking about an awful lot of lost days of work. yeah absolutely yeah um, so they've taken it impressively seriously as, as, as i think all productions that i've heard of have yeah uh, around the place so you know it's great to be back up and running but as i mentioned earlier we're just very appreciative of, of uh, you know how fortunate we are and yes. I remember earlier in the year i remember there was some comment about Tom Cruise losing his rag on the set of Mission Impossible but he's absolutely right yeah you know at part, of, part of, he's a producer on it so he was saying you've got to respect these protocols because uh, you know this is an expensive game we're playing oh, here absolutely um, yeah and uh, so people are being very respectful of that yeah. and uh, you know it's as I say it's just great to be back at work yeah of course of course I've just noticed there's a plaque over there on a stone which I've never seen okay, before so have a gander at that <clears throat> this tree celebrates the centenary of the Forestry Commission, 1919 to 2019. Thank you and good luck. <laughs> See you in a couple of hundred years when you're big and fat. Yes, right, yeah. So it is, um, if I said to you, how do you get on with Maggie Smith then? Well, she's I can't little... edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's pretty special. She's pretty amazing. Yeah. She's 85 plus. I oh, think. is she? Gosh. She, yeah, so, uh, and uh, she's a, well, it's like, I suppose if I was a tennis player, it'd be like playing with Federer or someone. Yeah. You just better be on the best, you know, on your top form when yeah, you're playing. Yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. She won't take any prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's uh, quite remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. here we are. Yeah, we're back again. Back at the old uh, pond. So you were saying earlier about this uh, little folly thing, this little yes. structure over there. Yeah, that's that was put up um, to do with uh, Viscount Cowdery, the third Viscount yeah. Cowdery. Well, Hugh and I are doing a bit of exploring, and we want you to come down to this. Whether we're supposed to be here or not is a bit side the point, really, because we already are. So this is it, Hugh. Oh, it's rather really beautiful, isn't it? It is, yeah. So this was put here in 2000. 2000, yeah. And as I think I mentioned to you earlier on, the, the top bits have got depicting hunting scenes. So there's fishing, yeah, fishing, fishing, and hunting, hunting, and polo, yeah. and what's happening? Just, just the South Downs, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it looks just like it. Yeah, there. I think it is. But it's very beautiful. Very it beautiful is. Very sort of it is. I'm sorry for trespassing. Yes, exactly. But you see the, the black swan is on its nest out there. Look, you oh, see that? Oh, yeah. It's strange. You come from that side to this. It's completely different, yeah. isn't it? But obviously, it's a different view because you're looking at it from a different perspective. But... It's just totally different. You know, I said to it, it was him, it's clearing out. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong you were. <laughs> so presumably this one, she has a uh, private place. No one's going to come near her. Absolutely. It's probably the only way they can protect them, isn't it? Yeah. I wonder well, if the ducks actually, I had a duck, we had a 
duck house for a while on our, on our pond and uh, I think we saw one duck take one look at it and decide it was you know it wasn't for it for them <laughs> went off somewhere else but <coughs> they always look nice though yeah so you got a couple of Canada, Canada, Canadian geese. Canada geese I'm just about to call them Canadian geese yeah. <laughs> hi gang yeah oh we've got a little one That's very sweet. We've decided the weather's not going to change, and my allotted time with Hugh is up. <laughs> More to the point, you promised me blue skies, and they're not here. <laughs> so this will be. We'll, we've got a lovely view of the black swan just in front of us, just there. So anyway, this will be Kevin and Hugh and saying Hugh. Bob and Hugh saying bye bye, and we'll see you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, Hugh. Cheers. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to follow, like and subscribe to Kevin's Rambles.